Okay, well, um, I have, ever since I last went to Cuba in October, I have been studying the Spanish language and trying to become a Spanish speaker. Estoy trabajando muy duro para hablar en español. Pretty good? Pretty good? Okay, so I am working very hard to learn this language. And as part of this, and this is just maybe the way I'm wired or whatever, I, I'm not just studying Spanish, I'm studying languages and just how they work and how the brain is wired for them, fascinating stuff to me. And so in this process, I came across this dude whose name I can't pronounce. His name is Toshi Konishi. That's how he's going to be called today. And he did this sort of research experiment. And what he was trying to study, he was trying to study how language affects our perception. And so he took a group of German speakers and a group of Spanish speakers. And English doesn't really do this, but in other languages, they'll have masculine and feminine words. And so, in, uh, and so the Spanish, well, we'll start with the German, the German word for bridge. It's like, it's like, I can't even say it, okay? I don't speak German, all right? But it's feminine, okay? The Spanish word for bridge, el puente, masculine. And so what he wanted to see is, did this different masculine and feminine understanding of what a bridge is affect their perception of bridges when they saw them? He showed them these different pictures of bridges. And here's what he found. What he found was that German language speakers, their word is feminine, when they looked at pictures of bridges, they would describe those bridges as elegant, beautiful, serene, peaceful. Then he would show the same pictures of bridges to people from Spain who spoke Spanish and when he showed them this picture, and they have a masculine word for bridge, they would describe the same bridges as sturdy, big, long. Some of them would say dangerous or risky. And so his study determined that, his study determined that if they had a masculine word for it, they would have masculine descriptions, and a feminine word for it, feminine descriptions, and that language actually affects our perception. That was his whole purpose in the study. Actually, has nothing to do with my purpose in sharing it today, although I do find that fascinating. <laughs> the reason I wanted to share that story is because you and I know, deep down, innately, and every human being knows it, even if they've gotten too smart for their own good and buried it beneath a bunch of weird, strange logic, everybody knows that men and women are different. Everybody knows that masculinity has its own distinct expression and femininity has its own distinct expression. And that came out in this experiment in just people's subconscious in the way they described things. Now, this is obvious to most of us. It's obvious to most any parent who's had both a boy and a girl. It's obvious to generations for however many generations back we go it's becoming increasingly obvious in science as they study the difference between male and female brains. And yet, despite all these facts, Western culture continues to put its head in the sand and deny it and pretend that there's really no such difference that we've imagined between male and female, masculinity and femininity. They use this very elegant and brilliant language. They say it's a social construct. And what that means is that if we just give little boys dolls and, uh, I don't know, makeup and girl things, and if we, just, uh, if we give girls Tonka trucks and lightsabers, this whole thing will be reversed in a generation or two. And consequently, when you ask the average person, what is masculinity? What is femininity? Deep down, we might know, but we're almost even afraid to voice it for fear of being castigated as this sort of extremely judgmental or stereotypical person. We're so confused, it's like we have trouble articulating it. Do you know what masculinity is? And can you clearly articulate it? We hear a lot about toxic masculinity, but do we hear anything about masculinity? Do you know what femininity is? And can you articulate it? We know a lot about feminism, but not much about femininity. There's a lot of confusion. And how can you be the man of God or the woman of God? 
that you're called to be? And how can you raise your children or your grandchildren to go from little boy to man of God or little girl to woman of God if you don't know what these things are? You might know it deep down, but I want to bring it to the surface so that we can articulate it, so that we can live it out. And my heart for each person here as we're going to talk about masculinity and femininity, is that rather than doing what our culture does, which is deny our own design, I want you to understand why God made you the way he made you so that you can know the freedom of living out that design. You see, what the world says is that, no, no, don't, don't get in this whole design business and, and, and all of that, because what that does is limit us, and it puts us into a box, and I can be whatever I want to be, don't limit me. And it's a very narrow-minded way of looking at it. If you look at a fish, you might say, well, its design limits it from running marathons. <laughs> Or you might look at it with a real common sense perspective and say its design liberates it for riding the waves. And so my heart for you is to understand your design so that instead of being a fish trying to walk, you're a fish that swims. You're a man or a woman made in the image of God who knows how to live that out in masculinity and femininity. That's my heart for today. And so we're going to go back to the original design. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And what's been happening has been that God has been creating stuff up until the verse we get in. We're going to begin in verses 26 and 27. The creation of mankind, the sixth day. We're going to see in verse 27 the first poem in all of Scripture celebrating man's uniqueness and woman's uniqueness as God's creation. So let's pick it up, verse 26 and 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, before we unpack this verse, I just want to let you know about this sermon series that we're beginning that's called Sacred Selfie. Sacred Selfie. And, and it's a study throughout this whole series. We're going to be studying the image of God. And there's more in those two verses than I can talk about in an entire message. It is profound. It is amazing when you really understand what it means to be made in the image of God. And the whole world is out there trying to define themselves and their own identity through their accomplishments or their beauty or their this or their that. But we're set free from all of that. You don't have to prove how special you are when you know how special it is to be made in the image of God. This week we're going to talk about human sexuality, particularly masculinity and femininity. Next week you will not want to miss, we're going to talk about human destiny and how that plays out in the things that you do. The week after that, human value, and last of all, human redemption. Sacred selfie, studying what it means to be made in God's image. So now coming back uh, to these verses, there's so much we could talk about, but I'm just going to make two observations about these verses, and here's the first one. Number one, masculinity and femininity are a God construct, not a social construct. Masculinity and femininity are a God construct, not a social construct. From the very beginning, on the first page of the Bible, God was the one who designed them to be male and female. This was God's idea. This didn't come about by Tonka trucks and teapots. This was God doing it. It wasn't a social construct. And coming, uh, and, and that, that's what we get from the text, but, but it's not just the scripture that supports this. It's actually the evidence. Has anyone in this room ever heard of the gender equality paradox? You probably haven't, because the culture that is pushing so hard that we're just unisex, the culture that is pushing that so hard that does not want you to hear about it, but here's what the gender equality paradox is. You can Google it later. What it, what it, what it says is that in, in countries where the, that are most what they call egalitarian, that most support equal rights for women and all this, and, and by the way, 
I'm for equal rights because the passage we just read, men and women are equal, both made in the image of God. So I'm all for that. But what's ha- what they've done is they've looked at the effect of that on the culture, and it's been the opposite of what they've thought. In these cultures where, where women are granted the rights and freedoms that they rightly deserve, where they're treated equally in the workplace, what they've seen to be the outcome is that men end up choosing more masculine jobs, stereotypically, and women end up choosing more feminine jobs in nations that are more egalitarian. And it's the opposite in nations that are less egalitarian. You see, it's the opposite. What you would expect is, hey, this is egalitarian, and they're trying to give everybody equal rights. You would expect that that in such a culture that men and women would start to blend to the point of it becoming unisex like many people in our culture want it to be. But it's actually the opposite because social construct theory doesn't work. It's not forming little boys to be more like girls and little girls to be more like boys. It's not doing that. And so it's actually, it's biblical, but it's also just what the evidence said. Second observation I want to Uh, I want to make about this text, is that men and women are equal but not interchangeable. Men and women are equal but not interchangeable. Equal, why? Because we're both made in the image of God, and we both represent him on the earth, man through his masculinity, woman through her femininity, but we are side by side in this. We both are equally made in the image of God and therefore have dignity, worth, and value before him, and yet... Equal is not the same as interchangeable. God didn't make them Adam and Steve. He didn't make them even Brenda. (laughs) He made them Adam and Eve because together their masculine and feminine differences complement one another to create the full picture of what God is like. If you had a whole world full of Adams and Steves, okay, I'm going to stop that one, all right? If you had a whole world of men, well, I mean, you might have some, like, heavier rocks lifted or something, but we'd have, like, a whole bunch of problems, okay? And we'd have a way less complete picture, a way less complete picture of who God is. And if we had all women in the world, we'd have a way less complete picture of who God is because we both represent him complementarily, like pieces of a puzzle. Again, this is what the science demonstrates. I read this a few years ago in an article in The Guardian, and they performed like the largest study at that time, and I don't know if there's been a larger one since, but, they, but it was a big study. They studied a 1,000 brains, men and women's brains, like 500, 500 roughly uh, between the men and the women of their brains. And what they found was that the women brain is like the, the connections between the right and left hemisphere, they're like going all back and forth. It's like crossing over back and forth. And the men's connection is just like, <laughs> just like all on one side. You got a little bit of connection there. And, they, and then they, they kind of extrapolated what this means for how we process things. And here's, here's what they said. They said, based on the formation of men's and women's brains, what we found is that women are better at multitasking, intuitive thinking, empathy, and remembering things. Ladies, don't blame us. It's our brain's fault. (laughs) Men are better at perception and intense focus. Watching the game, I'm watching the game, I'm watching the game. And coordinated action. Coordinated action. So I think it's funny, first of all, that we have to study a thousand brains to like figure out what everyone knew. Like we all knew that. Everyone in this room did. Here's what one of the co-authors of the study said as a conclusion, Ruben Gur. He says, it's quite striking how complementary the brains of men and women are. Now, it's striking if you're a scientist in the 21st century who's bathed in a unisex culture. It's not striking if you're Moses writing thousands of years ago by the revelation of the Holy Spirit about what happened at creation. He saw this from the very beginning, complementary, male and female. And so the way that complementary works, and this this has to correct what has often been a biblical misunderstanding of what we mean by differences between men and women. A lot of people have wrongly understood it to mean that like, oh, women, they're just like the weaklings and men, they're the strong ones. But that's not what it means. 
complementarity means that women are strong where men are weak, and men are strong where women are weak, and they complement one, one another so they make a better team. That's what complementarity means. So ladies, if you've ever heard it taught in a biblical context that you're the weakling in the marriage or in society or whatever, that's not what it means. Male and female, side by side, complementary with our differences. Got it? So both man and woman image God, one through masculinity, the other through femininity. Now let's talk about, more specifically about the masculine, masculine and feminine expressions. And we're going to break that down. And that's going to take us into Genesis 2. If you have a Bible, you can flip the page over, but we'll have the ver- verses up on the screen too. Genesis 2 is like the second version of the creation story. Genesis 1 is like the zoom out version. Genesis 2 zooms in on the sixth day, upon the creation of mankind. In the passage we'll read, Adam has already been created from the dust in the ground. Eve is about to be created, but it's a zoom in. That's one difference. The other difference is that Genesis chapter 1 is focused mostly, when it comes to man and woman, on our equality of essence and worth and value. But Genesis 2 begins to focus on our differences in terms of role and function within this complementary partnership. Now, some of the examples we're going to share today are for within marriage, but for single people in the room, it's not like you have to be married to be, <coughs> excuse me, to be masculine if you're a male or married to be feminine if you're a female. And so, uh, it's, it'll apply in both situations. But let's go ahead and read verse 15 through 25. Chapter 2, verse 15 through 25. Man's been created. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, a paradise, to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. That word fit means a complement. Verse 19, Now out of the ground... The Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Now, now just to stop there, you remember the original commission from chapter 1 to rule over the animals? That's what Adam's doing right here. He's fulfilling this commission, and he's classifying them according to their nature and their essence and their function, and he's naming them. And one of the things we see in the Scripture is that anytime there's a naming, it speaks of leadership. And so he has a leadership function here, but there's also a second dynamic taking place. God has identified that it's not good for Adam to be alone, but Adam hasn't identified it yet. He's just swinging around in the jungle having a great time. And then he sees these, I don't know, giraffes marching off in pairs and these baboons marching off in pairs. And finally, after a good long day of this, he starts to realize, where's my pair? And then that's when this happens. It says, Adam, for Adam, there was not found a helper fit or complimentary for him. So the Lord, ca- the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, uh, and this this is another poem, you could really think of it as, as a song. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So from this passage, let's look at three differences uh, between masculinity and femininity, man and woman. Number one, number one, God designed man to be the head and woman to be the heart. God designed man to be the head and woman to be the heart. 
first of all, part of the reason I use this language, just think about your own human body. What's more important to your survival, your head or your heart? Your brain or your organ, your heart, which one's more important? If you don't have a heart, you die. If you don't have a brain, you die. They're both equally vital in this relationship, yet they do serve a different function. So let's talk about the man, the male, as the head. And what I want you to pay attention to is that everything that I'm saying goes back to the original design. Everything I'm saying goes back to God's perfect world, the way he made it to be. This was not like male leadership, male headship. This was not a result of sin entering the world. This predated sin entering the world, and we're going to see that. Now, there's a lot of ways that I could point to this, but I'm going to stick with one chief fact here because this is the one that the Apostle Paul seems most fixated on in the New Testament Here's one way that we know that man was designed to be the head, and I'm speaking specifically in the marriage, head of the household, also in the church, and the function and role of elder is what the Apostle Paul talks about. But how do we know that God designed man to be the head? This is how Adam was formed first. Adam was formed first. This is exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. It's exactly what he says in 1 Timothy 2. This isn't just an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament thing. It wasn't just a cultural thing. It was rooted in the created order. When God wants to say that man is called to be the head, the leader, the context in which he's saying that, or the reason he's saying that is because Adam was formed first. This is important detail. God could have formed Adam and Eve at the same time. Why didn't he? God could have formed Eve first. Why didn't he? He formed Adam first. And when he formed him, he gave Adam the commission to take care of the garden. That was verse 15 before Eve ever showed up on the screen. Eve was to help and support him in that, but it was originally Adam's commission. Then in verses 16 and 17, what we notice is Adam was the one who received the commandment from God. Eve never received that commandment directly from the mouth of God. It was Adam's responsibility as the head to share this information, don't eat the fruit of that tree, with Eve. And by the way, he dropped the ball on that. She ends up muddling the commandment in chapter 3, and the reason is because Adam failed as a leader. So Adam's formed first. He's given the commission. Eve is to support him in that. He's given the spiritual vision. Eve is to support him in that. He's given the commission to rule over the creation, the animals. Remember, he goes through and he's naming them. This all happens before Eve even shows up on the screen, uh, on the screen, on the scene, as I watch too many movies lately. And then on that note, naming, who names who? Does Eve name Adam or does Adam name Eve? This is before the fall, it's before sin entered the world. Every single time anyone gets a name ever in the Bible, it always denotes the leadership of the person giving the name. Jacob says to the angel of the Lord, tell me your name. The angel says, I don't think so. In fact, I'm going to change your name. Your name's Israel. (laughs) It's always the one who is the leader in the relationship who assigns the name. All of this was God's perfect design. God designed man to be the head, to be the leader. He designed woman to be the heart. He designed woman to be the heart to be the heart. And what I mean by this chiefly is that she is to be in that relationship the responder and the life giver. Because isn't that what your heart does? It responds to the leadership of the head, but it also gives life to the marriage, if it's in a marriage, to the household, if there's a bigger household, and generally, honestly, in society. In fact, women, even your bodies are equipped. You are life givers. You're the heart of society. And when woman has this sort of inclination to yield to, specifically in marriage, a husband's leadership, it gives life to the marriage, to the family, and to society. When she resists this, what would happen if your heart resisted your head? When we, if, if a woman resists this leadership, well, what, the same thing happens that happened with Adam and Eve. You remember? When it came to the garden, 
Satan didn't go to Adam first. Satan went to Eve. And Satan tempted Eve to fall into sin, and then she leads her husband into sin. What we have here, what we have here is Adam abdicating his masculine responsibility to lead his wife into righteousness, and instead he follows her into sin. And Eve abdicates her feminine responsibility to yield to her husband's leadership, and instead, again, she leads him into sin. That's why when we get to chapter 3 and God is delivering the consequences for sin, what God tells them is that because of this, we're going to have gender wars. And you guys are just going to keep fighting and fighting and fighting. And it all goes back to this very beginning, a denial of the design of masculinity and femininity. The original sin was not just breaking a commandment. The original sin was denying a design of masculinity and femininity. Now, what we're going to see in these next two, as this plays out, because I know there will be some people in this room, and some of you are like cheering me on, and you're saying, yeah, 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 and others of you are like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and I know there's a various levels of opinion and thought on this. First, I just wanted to tell you, my goal is not to share opinions, okay? You don't come to church to hear opinions. Everybody has an opinion. My goal is to share with you what the Word of God says, even if it's contrary to the cultural opinion of the day and to many Christians' opinions who are more influenced by the culture than the Word of God. My goal is to share with you the Scripture, but not just that. By the end of the day, I want you to see the beauty of God's design, because it is, it is so beautiful. It is so beautiful when we live this out, and I, I really believe this. Every woman, when she understands what, the way male headship and leadership plays out, she's going to say, where do I sign up? I want that in my marriage. That's what I want, because you were designed to want that. And men, you're going to feel challenged. You're going to feel challenged to step up to the game and to live that out. But there's going to be something that resonates in your soul because this is a beautiful thing when it's lived out. And so these next two differences between men and women, these are really just the outflow in the expression of if we get this first thing right of man is the head and woman is the heart. So here is number two difference between man and woman. Number two, God designed man to be the provider and woman to be the pillar. He designed man to be the provider and woman to be the pillar. So let's start with man as the provider. Already, like, Michael, this isn't getting any better. Okay. Let me just say this. This does not mean that women can't provide. Eve certainly would have helped Adam in the garden. Proverbs 31, the ideal woman. She has some work outside of the home. It's not about that. What this is about is that the essence is this is an essence of masculinity. Adam was entrusted with working and tending the garden before Eve ever came around because he was entrusted with the job of providing for the family. God looked to him for this duty. And so what this means, young men, young men, if you're living with your parents and playing video games and working five hours a week, you've abdicated your masculine responsibility to work. Go out and get a job. Okay? And <laughs> someone's clapping. Uh, I, will, I will also say that married men, I know that you have a dream of being a Hollywood actor. You're like, no, I don't, but let's play with it, okay? I know you have a dream of being a Hollywood actor, but don't do so at the expense of your wife and your children and your manhood. You have to provide. It's on you. Woman works or doesn't work, y'all decide together. Makes more than you, that's cool. More power to you. Wonderful. It's a blessing. But the responsibility is on you. She gets the option. Responsibility is on you. Provider. But let's also not just think that this is provider of finances in this passage. Men, as a leader, you're not just a CEO. I just call the shots. That's all I do. <laughs> you're the CRO, the chief romance officer. <laughs> Adam first sees his lovely naked, or as we say in Texas, naked, wife. And he sings a song over her. And then verse 24, it doesn't say that woman is to pursue the man and marry him. It says that man is to pursue the woman and marry her. 
And this is a model not just for the initial act of marriage. By the way, young men, this is a model for dating. Married men, this is a model for marriage. You're the romance guy. Doesn't mean the woman doesn't have any role in the romance whatsoever. You're the provider. You're the initiator. You're the pace setter. And if your marriage doesn't have romance in it, men, God's looking to you first for that. So women, isn't it starting to sound a little bit better? Have a man as a leader? I spoke with my daughter. She's 11 years old, and the subject of dating came up because a brother was teasing her about you got a crush and blah, blah, blah. And we started talking about it and talking about age when it's okay to date and all of this. And one of the things that, <laughs> did someone say 40? <laughs> yeah, when you're 40, hon. <laughs> and one of the things I said to her was, I said, Anna, when it comes to that time, if a guy won't ask you out on a date, and if he won't romance you, and if he won't pursue you, he is not worthy of you. And husbands, fathers, you need to be teaching your daughters that, and you need to be modeling them what it means to be the CRO in your marriage. So provide that. Yeah, Valentine's coming up, so you got an opportunity. I'm going to give you just one more, because I just want to spend some time on this, because this is actually the most important. Men, you're the spiritual provider in the relationship I mentioned earlier that Adam was the one who was given the word of God. He was to impart that to Eve. Chapter 3, she muddled the command, and God looked not to Eve primarily for that mistake. He looked to Adam, who didn't clearly give spiritual direction to the family. Man, it's a tragedy. But this very morning, 25% of married women in America are going to church alone. It is time for us to stop riding the spiritual coattails of our wives to step up our game and lead our families spiritually. We need to be the ones calling for family Bible studies and family prayer times. We need to be the ones initiating these things because even if your wife is really spiritually mature, that's a burden that God didn't create her to bear. She actually wants deep in her soul to respond to your leadership in this. And you say, but... But Michael, you got to understand, like, like, my wife is like, you know, Mary, the mother of the Lord. I mean, she, she's like waking up early. She's fasting and praying. She knows far more Bible than me. Listen, this is not a contest. If your wife is a woman of prayer, if she's super spiritually mature, then she will be easier to lead in the relationship. This is actually what you want. This is, what a blessing, okay? This is not a contest. But God is looking to you, and the way we know for all of this leadership stuff, biblical leadership is not about being a hot shot calling the shots or a couch potato who says, woman, make me a sandwich. Leadership in the Bible is about a responsibility to lay our lives down in service and in giving the direction and the vision for the family. That's what it looks like. And part of the reason we know this, that it's about responsibility is that when Adam and Eve both eat the fruit, and technically Eve leaves, leads Adam into it, God doesn't go in sequential order and say, okay, Eve, let's talk to you first because you ate the fruit first. He doesn't do that, nor does he talk to them at the same time. Verse 9, God walks up, he says, where's Adam? Adam, where you at, bud? You failed. I told you to be the leader in this whole thing. You failed like across the board, man. Why weren't you there for your wife? Why weren't you giving her the vision and the direction? Men, responsibility's on you. Stop riding the spiritual coattails of your wife. She shouldn't be dragging you to church. You should be the one coming to church. You should be the one providing it. Or you should be the, not, you should both come. <laughs> but you should be the one providing that direction. Okay. So man is the provider. I spent a little time on that. But let's talk about this. Woman is the pillar. Woman is the pillar. In the home, in the marriage, in the family, in society, woman is the pillar. This word comes from verse 18, where it says I'll create, a, in verse 20, where it says I'll create a helper, fit, or complementary for him. I chose the word pillar on purpose, because this word helper has been greatly misconstrued to give us a wrong understanding of what it means to be a feminine woman of God. This word helper has been construed and communicated as though man just kind of sits around and gets served by his low-class servant girl who's subservient and just does whatever he wishes and carries out all of his whims. That's not what helper means in this passage. 
It does mean that she is to support him, but not through subservience. She's to support him with her strength like a pillar does a home or a building. That's what the woman is. The woman is strong, and she's strong, men, where you are weak. It's good to rely on her. It's good to lean on her. You're stronger for it. So a little example, and I will use a marriage example on this this week. This week uh, was a hard week for me. I, on Monday, found out that my favorite uncle, the one that I was in his house every single weekend without fail growing up, passed away on Monday. I found that out, and he was older. We kind of knew it was coming, but it was still hard. When I heard the news, I didn't eat. I heard it in the morning. I didn't eat the rest of the day. It's just sad. And then throughout that week, I had, even outside of that, I had several kind of uncharacteristic, like extra stressors occur. And then the week later in the week, I went to San Antonio for the funeral. And so kind of scheduled rhythm. Everything was just out of whack. I was stressed, and I was sad, and I was weak. And Alicia was a pillar for me in a thousand different ways. She was a pillar for me when I just wanted to sit there and not talk, and she hugged me. She was a pillar for me when she encouraged me and said, this is going to be all right, and this is going to work out, and I believe in you, and all of these kind of things. She was a pillar for me in the big things. She was a pillar for me in the fact that I was maybe not on my A game around the house. She picked up the slack for me, and she was a pillar for me in the small things. I got on the airplane, flew to San Antonio, and I landed, and I look at my phone, and I'm almost out of battery, and I think, I oh, forgot my charger. Remember how women are great at remembering things? I have just enough battery to see a text message. Wifey, that's what she is on my phone. <laughs> I open it up, no lie, it says, while you were walking out the door, I slipped a phone charger in your coat pocket. Oh, what do you know? It's right there. <laughs> no, I tell that. That's the smallest, smallest, smallest of stories. But those of you who are married know that small things are big things. And so she has been my pillar of support in a million different ways throughout this week. And men, you're wise to lean on that, to rely on that. It's not all about you. She has a strength that you need. So man is the provider, not meaning that the woman doesn't provide anything, but rather that the chief responsibility is on the man. Woman is to be the pillar, not to mean that the man never supports, but this responsibility is on a woman in her femininity. She's offering her strength where the husband is weak. Now let's look at the third and the last one. It's this. God designed man to be the protector and woman to be the savior. God designed man to be the protector and woman to be the savior. So let's start with men as the protector. You remember the story of Adam naming the animals? He wasn't just naming them random names. He wasn't like, I'll just call that gobbledygook. <laughs> he was actually assessing and evaluating its nature and naming it accordingly. Just like when he names Eve, he names her woe man because it means came out of man. And so what that means is he's kind of in the, that at least in that sort of understanding, kind of scientifically evaluating this thing. And what that means for our story is that Adam had already visualized the serpent. And he had already discerned its nature. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, that the serpent was more crafty than all the other animals. If Adam was doing his job as protector, he would have driven the serpent out of paradise rather than the serpent driving him out of paradise. He knew the nature, and he passively did nothing about it. He abdicated his masculinity by not protecting his wife. He just stood there and watched while the whole thing was coming down, and it was coming down. Men, God has anointed you to be a protector. You aren't to be the one who waits for someone else to jump in front of the bullet. You're to be the one that jumps in front of the bullet. You're not to be jumping behind your wife when you're walking through dark alleys. <laughs> you are. 
But this is all an analogy for a greater picture that goes beyond physical. God has given you a special keen discernment. You are like an eagle that flies overhead and has that special eyesight that can see serpents down below. The heart of your wife wants to trust you that you're actually doing this and you're not being passive like Adam. She wants to know my husband is securing me and he's protecting me and he's taking care of me and he's looking with foresight at the potential dangers so that he can step in the way before it ever gets out of hand. She wants to have that security. Are you offering it? The serpent in this story, when he invaded the garden, invaded Adam's home, his place of work, and his place of worship. All of these were one and the same his home, his place of work, and his place of worship. Men, you have an anointing from God to identify serpents in your home, that is in your marriage, in your family, potential dangers, in your workplace, and in your place of worship, in your church, and to step in proactively, not passively, and do something about it. I told my son Hudson a few weeks ago, I said there are three kinds of men in this world There are passive men who don't use their strength to protect, like like Adam in this story. I said there are abusive men that use their strength to harm women, and there are godly men who use their strength to protect women, and more broadly than women, society. Now let's talk about women as a savior. Women as a savior. This too comes from that word in verse 18 and 20 that's translated as helper. This word appears 21 times in the Old Testament. 18 of those times, it's a reference to God. For instance, Psalm 33, I think it's verse 20. It says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. What is God in this situation? Israel is saying, I'm weak and needy, and I'm about to lose a battle and lose my life, but God is my help and my shield. And so what he's saying is that God is my Savior. Women, what this word means, it doesn't mean you're the subservient little house girl. What it means is that you are the Savior of society generally, but especially of men. And how do you save men? If we do a survey of the scripture, what we see is that women save men through their wisdom. Women save men through their wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified not as a man, but as a woman. And when we look through the different stories of the Bible, and 1 Samuel, I want to say chapter 25, Abigail, she's not David's wife at this time, she becomes that later, But she saves David from a foolish and foolhardy decision because of her godly wisdom. Esther saves her husband from a foolish and foolhardy decision because of her godly wisdom. And then when we look at even an unbeliever, Pontius Pilate's wife, God didn't give Pilate the dream. He gave Pontius Pilate's wife the dream, don't crucify this man tomorrow. Why? Because God has a special anointing on women to impart wisdom. That's your anointing, ladies, and we men really need it. Pontius Pilate didn't listen to his wife, and he went through and crucified the king of the universe, and he has paid for it with his eternal legacy. Husbands, if your wife doesn't have a voice in the marriage, you are not leading the right way. Your wife should have a powerful voice because she has a special anointing from God to impart wisdom to you. And ladies, speak up because we need your wisdom. We need your wisdom. And unmarried ladies, please don't marry a chauvinist man who thinks that you have nothing to offer in terms of wisdom, who thinks he knows it all. No, you're the one. You have that special anointing to save men from their own foolishness and foolhardiness. So let's summarize where we've been. We're going to kind of close this out. God designed man to be the head and woman to be the heart. He designed man to be the provider and woman to be the pillar. He designed man to be the protector and woman to be the savior. And so I want to, the way I want to close this out is with a, uh, a story 
that captures two different approaches to this problem of the gender wars. Okay? So here's the story. I was reading a bedtime story to my kids, a story that you all know, the story of the three little pigs. Innocent enough story, right? And I'm reading it along, and they're all loving it, and, you know, pig number one, he's a dumb idiot, lazy, makes his house out of straw. What was he thinking, moron? Then pig number two, (laughs) what was he thinking? Made his house out of sticks. What a complete buffoon. Total idiot. Lazy, too. And then we got to third pig. She. She was intelligent. She was a hard worker. She had her act together. She was amazing. She was awesome in every way. I read it, and not to say that women aren't those things, but I read this story in the totality of the agenda that it was trying to pass, and I just kind of rolled my eyes. Next, take out another book. No lie, another Three Little Pigs book by a different author. This one like took place in a dojo, and they were like learning, you know, like... <laughs> like martial arts, but it's the same exact story. Pig number one, stupid idiot moron. What an idiot, so lazy. Pig number two, total buffoon. Sorry excuse for a pig. Number three, she was amazing, smart, intelligent, hardworking, awesome, and saved the day. And those poor, stupid, idiot man pigs, if they ever could just become more like a woman, then, yeah, man pig, it's a, it's, it's a thing. If they could just be women pigs, then they would be awesome. Do you see where I'm going with this? You see, here's the thing. Western culture has rightly identified a problem. And that problem is that throughout human history, women have not been treated as equals. God tried to set that straight through his word. They've not been treated as equals. They have been treated as subservient. And and they've been abused time and time again. But what's the world's solution to this? The world's solution is to elevate women, a good thing, by putting down men. And we see this again and again. Every sitcom that you you watch, the movies that you watch, the the children's books that you're reading, you can't escape it. Men are idiot buffoons and women are awesome. Why can't we both be awesome? Does the solution have, like that's just a perpetuation of the gender war. God has a totally different solution. And God's solution to the gender war is not denying our design. God's solution to the gender war is looking to our designer. In the beginning, we just read it, chapter 1, the scripture says, let us make man in our own image. Why the plurality? God exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, equal in essence, equal in value, equal in worth, different in role and function. The Father plans, the Son saves, the Spirit sanctifies. Equal in worth and value, different in role and function. And when God looked down on his creation and he decided to create mankind, he said, if I'm going to get them to image me and to look like me, I can't make them all the same. I'll make them equal, but I've got to make them different, male and female where man through his masculinity, woman through her femininity, together complement to create the full picture of the beauty of God. Differences are not demeaning, they are beautiful. And the more men act like men, and women act like women, and Christians act like Christ the more quickly we can get to a resolution of this gender war and the more we can show the world the beauty of our God. Let's pray.